What's up, everybody? Welcome into this edition of Warchant TV, joined by Gene Williams, founder and administrator of Warchant.com. I'm Aslan Hajavandi. If you're not a member of Warchant.com, you got some uh, idle time on your hands. Might as well hop on over, get involved in the conversation. Use the promo code WARCHANT30 for 30 free days of access to the Ultimate Semel Sports Source. Uh, we're going to talk recruiting, but Gene, we still got Seminole Madness going on over on Warchant. And if folks get involved and, and make the best case, they can win a $25 e-card to Garnet and Gold. So that almost pays for uh, a large part of the actual annual membership. So they should get involved, right? There you go. Yeah, it's easy. I mean, just go on the message board, make your case, and... Uh... It is a very easy way to do it because you know, a lot of people are participating, but not too many people are making a strong case. So get in there, get your stats together, get your argument, talk about when you saw the guys play in person, and it's a real good shot. You'll be uh, getting some FSU swag coming your way. Definitely. Um, you know, Seminole Madness, uh, the brackets were seated by Gene himself, Irish O'Fell, Corey Clark, and Jeff Cameron. People might be like, Aslan, were, you, were your feelings hurt? Uh, not at all because I get to do the recruiting retrospectives with Gene and we've done 2002, 2003. We're going to probably go in order unless you folks have a dying desire for us to hop around. But uh, we're now into 2004, Gene. And I'm not looking ahead to the other recruiting classes. I, I might end up saying this a few more times. But this one uh, is my absolute favorite class, just going back and looking at all these names for all the foibles of 2013 and, and what Ron Zook had done to this program, I guess. Florida State had two wins in a row over Florida. And um, they went ahead and they, they oversigned, I guess you could say, at least in this day and age, I guess 28 guys they signed. So what they lacked in 2003, I think there was a lot of hope and optimism uh, because of the numbers they signed and the stars next to a lot of these kids' names. Yeah, you're right. You got to give at least on um, paper the staff a lot of credit for bouncing back. Like we discussed, if you saw the 2003 video we did or read the story. You know, there's uh, they, they undersigned and then they had four guys not qualify and a lot of the guys and really wasn't a lot of star power either. This is kind of the opposite. Like you said, they had big numbers in the class that ranked anywhere from number one to number five, depending on what service you look at. And just looking at rivals, it's amazing. They had nine rivals, 100 guys in this one class alone. So you would think this would be an unbelievable class. And on paper it was. But you know how recruiting goes sometimes. And while the other class just lacked, you know, numbers and star power this one was kind of the other way where a lot of highly regarded guys just simply did not pan out you know gene we talked about how 2003 was probably kind of uh the beginning of the end or at least maybe the beginning of the beginning uh, of that lost decade but i feel like 2004 at least for me you know because now i've i've been on war chant at that point for a good like 18 months so i, I had a good feel for recruiting and and what prospects were were the top guys on the on the board but it felt like off the hoof, like the 2004 class, it just every position like needs were met, needs were met with, with really talented players. So I feel like so much maybe of the next ensuing seasons, the, the optimism that we kind of clinged on to might not have been so much Bobby Bowden's magic and, and his legacy, but just the fact that, well, these guys are going to get old eventually and they're going to be upperclassmen and uh, they got to be good. So this, I think, starts becoming the whole coaching versus, you know, talent kind of argument starts happening on War Champ. But, I mean, these guys, we're talking about top guys from Orlando, Miami. That was a big thing from 2003, right, Gene? Like, Florida State didn't get enough guys from South Florida. They go down there and get two great cornerbacks. Uh, it yeah. just, it's, it's crazy to see, you know, I can't remember feeling so good about a class as I did 2004 when, when the ink first started drying. When I was going back and looking at this story, I went back and read some of the old rival stories. And I think at the time they had the number one quarterback class, the number one linebacker class, and the number one defensive back class all in 2004. So you're right. They clean up. When you when you sign the number one quarterback in the country, Xavier Lee, and then the other another top ten quarterback in Drew Weatherford, and then you get guys like Lawrence Timmons and Jay Thaxon, who at the time was a big-time recruit. You get all the speed guys like Kenny O'Neill, Kenny Ingram was a big-time player. Aaron Jones, what a battle Florida State had with Miami going back and forth to get Aaron Jones. But again, when you go back, and you're right. The feeling was so optimistic at that point because 2003, you go, they just they just dropped the ball. They got out recruited. Well, they regrouped, hired Kevin Steele a little bit before that 2003 class. And let's say what you want about him. He might have been the one pretty good hire Bowden made during the, the lost decade. He did a really good job. It was a very hard work on recruiting. And I think just because they had that need, you're able to go get those big-time quarterbacks. So you're right. The state. Everybody was very optimistic. He said, okay, they had the one hiccup. Here we go. Florida State's going to get back to it. But, again, I go back to the fact that this is one of those classes that look great on paper. Man, when you go back in hindsight, 
I don't know if you want me to run the numbers yet, but I mean, it is incredibly sobering. I'll, I'll throw a few out there for you. Not a single one of these members, I, it was 26 or 28, whatever it was, none 26. of them made an All-American list. Uh, I'm sorry, one made an All-American list. Gary Sismacia, the kicker, made second-team All-American. Nobody on this list ever made first-team All-ACC. Um, I mean, I, I, almost half of them never even started a game. I mean, that's unbelievable. You can sign this many guys and so many don't get traded. I think it was only nine. I think it read nine out of the whole group started eight or more games. So a large majority just provided little, if any, contribution. Right. And uh, I think we could probably start at quarterback if we're going to talk about yeah. the uh, unfulfilled potential of this class, Gene. Uh, and, and Xavier Lee was destined to be mm. the guy. They also had Drew Weatherford, obviously, but I think most folks in most recruiting circles believe that it was Lee was going to be groomed to take over. Weatherford was a good insurance plan. Uh, that's not the way it worked out. But Xavier Lee, I mean, just uh, the amount of promise he had coming out of Daytona Seabreeze High School was, I mean, the, the, the sky was the limit with him coming into Tallahassee, right? I mean, it was this guy was unbelievable back in high school at Daytona Beach Seabreeze. At the time, he set the all-time state. This is the state of Florida. It's, it's pretty uh, good history of some great quarterbacks coming out of the state. At the time, he had the most passing yards, the most completions and the most touchdown by any quarterback in state history in high school. He was Mr. Florida, Mr. Football in the state of Florida. Everybody's number one All-American everywhere you want to go. Big kid, 6'4", 6'5". And I remember the whole, if you remember this from War Chain, I remember being out there. We used to go out to the summer workouts, and he watched this, and he got down on his knee, and they threw a football. I think he threw it like 60, 70 yards off his knee, and we got video of that thing. The guy just had an unbelievable arm. He just, how could this guy not fail? You know, when I did the write-up, if, if you're watching the video, I encourage you to go back and, and read my write-up on it. And one thing I was kind of careful to do in this is not to just throw the players like him or Drew Weatherford under the bus because you got to remember at the time, and now we know in hindsight to have Jeff Bowden as your offensive coordinator, a lot of the offensive coaching across the board in hindsight was just awful for Florida State at that time. So you really got to wonder if he had a Mark Rick, if he had a Jimbo Fisher or somebody like that to really coach him up or coach Drew Weatherford up the story could have been completely different for these guys. I mean, on the flip side of that, though, I guess one of the, the, the feel-good sort of moments from this class uh, was a guy from South Carolina, Lawrence Timmons, uh, a linebacker mm -hmm. that uh, I think, again, that was another battle that, that went down to the wire from Florida State, and uh, he ended up you know, becoming one of the, the lone shining stars of that class. He really was outside of Gary Macy, the kicker who had an unbelievable last season for Florida State. He was really the only guy you look at this class and go, wow, he lived up to expectations and then some. And, you know, really the thing is it was all done in one season. He had a great final season, junior season of Florida State before declaring pro and being a first-round pick by the Pittsburgh Steelers. But, man, he was a pleasure to watch out there. And I, I, the, first, the only player I've ever seen maybe do this in college, and I remember Florida State lost the game, but they're playing the Florida Gators. And I remember this memory, and Tebow went running out to the side, and nobody – got Tebow from behind. I mean, I remember one play, he picked Tebow up and threw him backwards. I remember the look on Tebow, like, wow, no one, no one's able to do it. Miss this kid was country song, strong. Obviously, he had a really good career for the Steelers and in the NFL. So that was one of uh, that was one of Kevin Steele's recruits. That was his area of South Carolina. And linebacker, was he was obviously coaching at the time, did a tremendous job taking him away from the, the South Carolinas and the Clemsons of the world and getting him down to Florida State. Gene, it's just, it's just so crazy to go back and look at this list of names. And, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pulling it up right here. And it's, um, I, I mean, I remember all these guys. Like, you know, Jay Thaxton, that was a guy that actually had a, a pretty good, uh, you know, sort of spark. He, he was flashing early on. But I think either a neck problem or concussions kind yeah. of sidelined him. Um, you know, Tony Carter, obviously, uh, a little bit undersized, but, you know, played above his his weight class for so many years. D. McClure, I mean, all these, I mean, D. McClure had the nickname the Executioner, Barry Wright, the Pipe. Uh, you talk about Gary Sissom Mesa, the good. Weed. I mean, all these, I mean, just this class was filled with that kind of urban legend, uh, you know, this guy is like the unicorn, he's going to be great. And then it's just crazy to see how uh, none of them really kind of, you know, shook out. Running back was another crazy sort of. Uh, deal there with a, a guy like Jamal Edwards out of you know North Carolina we thought had high hopes for and, and he didn't end up uh, amounting to a lot around here Lamar Lewis was another guy at that position I mean it, it's I mean Jonathan Warren a guy that never even got on campus and then my guy Greg Carr Greg Carr there you go. Yeah. he's another guy that you know for some reason Greg Carr gets a bad rap all these years later but was it was a pretty productive wide receiver um, I just it's can you think I mean anything before 2004 where there was so many uh, guys that just didn't work out. I mean, you, you mentioned some of those numbers about these guys not making All-American lists or 
but really starting a lot of games. I mean, how does that happen? Yeah, like you said, some of it were injuries, some of guys getting kicked out of school, some of guys transferring, some guys just not panning out. You're right, it was just it was a perfect storm of a lot of guys failing. You mentioned like a, a Jonathan Warren, and I got to see him play a couple times for Madison County. Man, this was he was just he was one of those Madison kids, kind of you know you see it now a little bit with the guys that have been here recently. But he could just he was a, he was an enforcer in that second year, and it was looking forward to him. And I think he got. He got arrested with a felony, I believe, shortly after signing day. So he, FSU had to pull his scholarship. I mean, stuff like that happens. You mentioned Jay Thaxon, who's one of the top linebackers in the country, had injuries that derailed his career. You know, and you had guys like I remember Kenny Ingram and Aaron Jones, but the two teammates from Orlando. Mm-hmm. And these were two of the highest regarded kids in the state of Florida for that recruiting class. And they were just absolute, they were going to be sure things coming in here. And just neither of them, they barely played. I don't know if, if Aaron Jones even ever started a game. And Kenny Ingram might have started two or three. I think he ended up moving to wide receivers last yeah. year to Florida State yeah. and really never did anything. And then you get a couple guys from Lincoln that were supposed to be big-time players. Joe Manning, remember him, and Rodney Gallon. And um, neither of those guys, I don't think, ever started a game at Florida State. And Trevor Ford, there's another one. There's another one of those big-time defensive backs out of Miami that was supposed to be an absolute stud and never started a game. I think he transferred out. Yeah. And then I know your favorite all-time offensive line, line Jeff Barnyard, uh, was a member of that class as well. So, yeah, it's just you can go on and on and on with all these guys that for whatever reason, whether it was coaching injuries, just off the field problems, just did not pan out. Do you have any good Jeff Bernard stories for us, Gene? <laughs> I don't know if I want to throw one of the bus too much. There's, you know, Let's just say his 40-yard dash was uh, something to behold. I don't want to get into him too much. I'll say the one other kind of a story, none was in him for another offensive lineman, which was interesting. And I've got a little bit in the write-up on the 2204 class is Calvin Darity. I don't know if you remember him. Yeah. It was the Florida State Tallahassee Lincoln at the time. You remember this was the pipeline. I mean, you know, whether it was Camardi, uh, Fred Rouse, you know, Gallon, all these guys I mentioned. I mean, player after player that was worth anything would always come to Florida State, and they had one of the top offensive linemen in the country that year in Calvin Darity. A position it was a huge position of need for Florida State. And right before signing day, he does an announcement, I think, on one of the local TV stations. You're going, he's announcing on local TV. It's a pipeline. He's in Tallahassee. Surely he's going to go to Florida State. He announces for North Carolina. I mean, people were shocked when this happens. And uh, so he ends up going there and ends up being a two- or three-year starter for him. I don't think he was a, wasn't an NFL guy, but a guy that contributed. I think he got ACC honorable mention honors. And somebody Florida State could have desperately used. Of course, they get the other two Lincoln kids that don't amount to anything. So that was the one story of kind of a, a big miss they had in that class. Right. Other than Jeff Bernard, though, I mean, Dumaka Atkins, I thought was, was he was looked upon as being a blue-chip offensive lineman. Yeah. Uh, Jackie Claude was a, was a big-time prospect. And Cornelius Lewis, I think, you know, talking to guys that actually played uh, during that era, thought that he might have been the best out of the bunch, but he was a guy that, uh, you know, was, was kicked off campus, I think, not too long after, I think, Fred Rouse actually ended up getting dismissed there in 2005. So... Again, just you know, all the the positions or all the the needs that they had after that 2003 class, like they met them and and then some, and it's just crazy to see how it how it all shook out. So with that, uh, Gene, uh, you know, number one quarterback, record breaking guys on this list, uh, Greg Carr, uh, double digit touchdowns and in, in, in a seasons on the list. I mean, is there anybody that's like your favorite when you look back on it? You know, it was fun to cover. I mean, a lot of, like you said, the personalities were all over the place. I mean, I, I had a really good relate. J.R. Bryan, I had a good relationship talking to him all the time. And during the recruiting process, Xavier Lee, I was good friends with one of his coaches there at Seabreeze, so was getting that constant thing with him. I mean, it was a great bunch of guys. They were a lot of fun to cover, but unfortunately on the field, it, it just obviously didn't work out. And I'm with you. I'm glad you brought up Greg Carr. I think he gets a little bit of a bad rap. Again, in uh, in Jeff Bowden's offense, but man, was there anybody better at the jump catch? Oh, man. I mean, you throw that little that little fade route right in the back of the end zone. Man, he was money on that play. Now Jeff Bowden would go to it twenty times a game, but I mean, it did work at times. So I mean, I thought again, better coaching. Maybe he has a much better career at Florida State. So uh, yeah, there's a lot of fun guys to deal with there. I remember uh, the weed. Uh, Really good kid. Remember the whole thing? He had the long hair, and then he cut it, and he gave it to, I think, one of the locks, one of the uh, cancer yeah, charities. Yeah, locks, locks for Love you know, or whatever that. it is, yeah. Locks for Love for them. I remember Kenny O'Neill came in here, and he was the guy who was supposedly like a 4-2 guy. Everybody was all excited about him, and obviously that didn't that flamed out. That did not work out very well either. So a lot of interesting guys, and, uh, you know, again, it's further evidence of why what we saw. They really still were not that bad at this point. You remember they're fresh off of beat Florida. 
But, boy, once you start going to that 2004, 5, 6 season, man, you see the huge decline. And the problem with this was not only this class that underachieved, but you go back and look in the rivals. If you go look at the rankings, right, and you know who else is in the top, I think, top five or at least top ten? Both Florida and Miami are right there, too. So they are not losing any ground. And then Florida State is losing ground class after class after class, which is obviously contributing to these problems. I know some of the stuff isn't completely accurate, but I think 2004 has Florida State as a number one class, Michigan two, LSU three, uh, Miami four, and then the Gators at five. So I do think by 2004 the database was uh, polished up quite nicely. Um, Yeah, absolutely incredible. Um, It's just that class, man, just what could have been. It it pretty much uh, (laughs) – is the absolute gold standard for uh, what could have been when it comes to recruiting. So uh, we'll go ahead and we'll look forward and we'll look ahead to the next one, Gene. I think we'll go to 2005. Uh, a little, little funk we're going to have to put on top of that one when we uh, when we reconvene. I, I'm getting, yeah, I know, Funky Fred. We'll have to, you'll have to tell a story there with your, uh, your famous intern, your best uh, story yeah. feature ever written. Yeah. But stay tuned for that one. That'll be fun. I almost want to skip ahead because this is getting depressing, Aslan. <laughs> I almost want to skip ahead to like 2010 or something Okay. so we can at least have a smile on our face. Maybe we'll do that. We'll do that. You call the shots, Gene. I'm so long for the ride. Appreciate it. He's Gene Williams, the founder and administrator of WarChant.com. I'm Maslin Hudjavani. Thanks for watching. Stay connected to WarChant.com.